this week uh, specifically had a chance to focus a lot on um, that we are not of this world if we are truly in Christ. Now, there's a lot of people who say, because I go to church, I call myself a Christian, and now I'm not of this world. And they really work hard to be different than other people in this world. But unless they are truly in Christ, they're not attached to the vine, and really they can do nothing to glorify God. That's what Jesus said. And we need to make sure that we are attached to the vine. And so I thank God that we are all attached to the vine. But there are many, many people who are not. And there are many, many things happening in the world that have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. But yet the kingdom of heaven is here and we're here for a purpose. If we're here still in this world, then we're not of the world. We're simply in the world. And there's a reason for that. The Lord wants us here. When Rose had her accident, she should have died in all human terms. She knows that. Even the doctor and the nurses told me that. <clears throat> and yet here she is because there's work for her to do. David, you're still here because God wants to use you. Same with you and Monica, uh, Monica and Pascal. And um, for Michelle and I, I mean, the Lord wants to use us in this world. But yet we have been called out of this world and we are not of this world. And so as you can see here, it says in the world but not of the world. Well, once again, that's easy to say. Most people don't understand that because you have to understand that from a spiritual standpoint, supernatural standpoint, because if you simply understand it from a human aspect, then you're going to understand it like everyone else in the world because it'll hold no greater meaning. It can't. And if you see what Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2, where Paul wrote to uh, the church in Rome, therefore I urge you brothers on account of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That means you are sacrificing who you are to God. This is not what most people do. They make a sacrifice. They may sacrifice some of their time. They may uh, claim that they're sacrificing but here, the appeal is to offer your bodies, that means all of you, as living sacrifices. You are now no longer living for yourself. You are now no longer living for this world, but you are living for the Lord. Holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And we've talked about this before. If you really want to worship God, then be sacrificial with all of yourself, fully surrender yourself to God. That is pleasing to God. That is our service of worship. And then he continues and he says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not accept the things of this world as though they're okay. Don't be conformed. Don't say, I will go ahead and acclimate to this world because you are no longer of this world, and we're going to really talk heavily about that because there are many scriptures that, that speak directly to that. But do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That means become something totally new by the renewing of your mind. Do not think like you always thought growing up. Do not think like an intellect. Do not think like an adult supposed to think. That's what he's telling us. We're, Jesus said, become like this child. What does a child do? They don't overthink it. They trust. They trust in who can overthink it. And that would be their parent or their parental figure. And that's what he calls us to do. Don't overthink it. Just trust me. That's what the Lord says. I'm the good shepherd. Just trust me. Follow me. Listen to my spirit because my spirit is truth. Then it says, you will be able to test and approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And that's what we're called to do. Follow Jesus, do the will of God. What is good, pleasing, and perfect? Well, the only way we're gonna find that is if we don't become like this world and we allow ourselves to become transformed and we follow Jesus. 
So in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 22, Jesus said, you know, if the world hates you, well, understand that it hated me first. If, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own, which many people who claim to be in Christ are really deeply loved by this world, and the world would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world. But I, personally, I have chosen you out of the world. We didn't choose to leave the world. Jesus chose us out of the world. Then he goes on, he says, remember the word that I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. Don't conform to them is what he's saying. If they kept my word, well, then they would keep yours as well. But they will treat you like this because of my name, because of the name of Jesus Christ, since they do not know the one who sent me, the Father. They do not know God. If I had not come and spoken to them, well, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. Jesus is making it perfectly clear. You do not belong to the world. Yes, love them, be compassionate, but there's no excuse for them. Don't make an excuse for them. They know that they're sinning and they'll go on sinning and they have no excuse for their sin. Now it's our human nature that says, well, I wanna show them love and compassion and I want to feel sorry for them and I want to try to make some way that I can just adjust and adapt to their sinful life. But Jesus said, don't do that. I've called you out of the world. And because of that, they're going to hate you because they're not going to understand that you're truly loving on them. They're going to make it as though you're judging them and that you won't accept them. And Jesus prayed to his father this. I have given them, meaning his disciples, meaning us, your word, the truth, and the world has hated them for they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, Father, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So sanctify them by the truth, by the spirit, which is truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. So just as Jesus was sent to the world for the world to find salvation in him, not in what they want, but in him, we are sent into this world so that others can find salvation in him, not by us, but in him. For them, I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified by the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Verses 6 to 16, Paul wrote, you know, among the mature, however, we speak a message of wisdom. Now, we can't speak this around the immature. We can't speak this around the, the ones who are not spiritual. We cannot speak this to ones that don't have the spirit. But not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of the mysteries and hidden wisdom of God one of which is we are truly not of this world. We're in it, but we are not of it, which he destined for our glory before time began. Now, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Rather, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no heart has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us, how? Not by our own reading, not by some pastor telling us, but by the spirit. The spirit is what re reveals God's mind. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except his own spirit within him? So too, no one knows the thoughts of God 
I don't care how holy they think they are, how much they've memorized from the Bible, how they live their lives. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, if you're in Christ, that same Spirit lives within you. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the world is prevalent, trust me. The Spirit that we received is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. That's the way we understand it. Not from trying to discuss it or live apologetics or uh, argue with other people about it until we come to an understanding. No, it's freely given to us, that understanding from the Spirit of God. And this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Now, the natural man, the person who's afraid of the Spirit, the person who doesn't have the Spirit, well, they do not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They cannot, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, the spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So the world can't instruct us. The world will tell us, no, you need to do this and you need to do that. Oh, we're gonna take away your 501c3. The world can tell us all kinds of stuff. Oh, you have gotta stop talking that way or we're going to go ahead and shut you down. The world will come after us, they'll hate those who are in Christ. But they don't have the mind of Christ. Only those who are in Christ, only those who are not of this world are aliens of this world. And only people who are aliens of this world are those who are in Christ. And that's us, those who are counted among the elect because he chose us. We didn't choose him. There are many who claim to be in Christ who say, I chose Christ. Well, that's not the way it works. And we know that. Jesus said that we need to enter through the narrow gate. And we've talked about this a lot. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. But this is the way of the world. This is for people who are of the world. And many enter through it, many. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life. He's talking about eternal life. And this is the way of the Lord. This is not being of the world. This is being of the Lord. And only a few find it. And in Luke, he says it a different way. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try. They'll try to enter, and they will not be able to. Well, Jesus didn't hedge words when he was speaking this. He came right out and said it. This is the way of the world. This is the way things are going to be. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, it says, We know that anyone born of God does not keep on sinning. I cannot tell you how many years when I was going and participating in the church system, that I saw people who I knew were sinning all week long, but coming back and refreshing on a Sunday morning. Give me two hours to feel better. And then they go back out living their lives sinning. And I know this because many of them reached out to me and said, will you pray for me? I'm having a problem with this or I'm having a problem with that. And I thought, how can you go on practicing sin? And then the Holy Spirit revealed, because they're not bearing fruit and they're not bearing fruit because they're not attached to the vine. They may be going to church well enough. They may believe in Jesus well enough, but they are not surrendering and sacrificing their lives the way Paul said in Romans that we need to sacrifice our bodies and surrender ourselves. They weren't doing this. They were living a religious false life, the one that this world would offer. They were of the world, but wanting to have one foot in and one foot out. But Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. Your master is not me. 
unless you surrender to me, and then I will choose you. You don't make that choice. You can't choose to live halfway this way and halfway that way. So what is it for us who are in Christ? Are we to judge them? Absolutely not. We're to love them and understand. We can understand why they're still lost because they have not chose to surrender of their lives sacrificially in this world. They chose to remain in this world because it's what they love. So they go on sinning. And it says anyone born of God does not keep on sinning. The one who was born of God, well, he is protected by God. The one who was born of God protects him. Jesus will protect us if we are truly in Christ. But it says, and the evil one cannot touch him. So if we are truly sacrificing our lives and following Jesus, we're not like the world. We don't have to worry about those day in and day out struggles and, oh, woe is me because I want to live in, like the world and be in the world, but yet I want to follow you, Jesus. I don't know what to do. Well, that's because you haven't surrendered your life to Christ. You haven't chosen to let go of this world and give your life to Christ, to really give your life to Christ. You've made kind of a, a, a half hedge compromise. And many people do this. Jesus said it. Many take the broad path that leads to destruction. Only a few will ever find that narrow gate, that narrow door. And he goes on to write, we know that we are of God and that the whole world, the, and that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. So if you are not of the world, you are not under the power of the evil one. And that's why it says that the, the Lord will protect us. And the evil one can't touch us. But if you have not truly been transformed, you believe you have, you maybe pray a prayer, you maybe live a religious life, a good life, and you strive to do good, just like the Jews did. It means nothing. And you become part of the world. And the world is under whose power? Is under the power of the evil one. And you will believe the lies. You will believe the delusion. And you will not understand anything that's from the Lord. Why? Because you don't have the spirit to interpret those things, to give you that knowledge and wisdom and that insight. And it goes on to say, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. So we're blessed. The world can't understand, but we can. Why? Because the Son of God has come through the power of the Holy Spirit and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And then it goes on to say, little children, keep yourselves free from idols. An idol is anything that is in our lives that we put before God's commandments, before God. Because our, our first commandment is to put God first. If we put an idol in our lives and that becomes what drives us each day, we are no longer living for the Lord. We're living for our idol. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John wrote, do not love the world or anything in the world. Jesus said it. He said, if you love your mother and your father and your brother and your sister and your kids and all that, then the love of God's not in you. In other words, you must hate them. Well, he wasn't saying to hate anybody. He was saying profoundly that don't love what's in this world above me. And so it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We put God first because that's our first love. And when we love God first, we will love everything in the world from God's perspective. We'll love our families. We'll love our friends. We'll love our neighbors. We'll love our enemies. We'll love everybody but from God's perspective. But what John's talking about here are idols. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Do not put that in front of God 
or in front of other people, because that's our second commandment. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Everything in this world is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the good and perfect will of God remains forever. I mean, John just beautifully repeated what Jesus taught. He goes on to say in 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, you, little children, are from God and have overcome them. He's talking about the people in the world. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We have a far greater power within us than the evil one has over the people in this world. They are of the world. That is why they speak from the world's perspective. They have no other choice. They have no other option. And the world, well, it listens to them. But we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us because they couldn't. They couldn't understand what's coming from the Spirit of God. That is how we know the spirit of truth. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know that if we follow Jesus, which is the right way, and the spirit guides us, the spirit is the truth. We don't have to wonder, oh, no, am I doing the truth? If the spirit lives within you, you have the truth. And Jesus gives us life because of that. So says that that is how we know that the spirit of truth is different from the spirit of deception. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Then he goes in and he really emphasizes our commandment that we love one another because love comes from where? It comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. However, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. James wrote in James 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. We know that they're gonna be distressed because an orphan has no one to care for them and a widow no longer has a place that they once had in life. And many societies just push them away. So in their distress, care for them. And then he goes on to say, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world, by its music, by its fads, by its sickness, by its sin. Keep yourself from being polluted by the world. In James 4, verses 4 through 8, he wrote, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world renders himself as an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to dwell in us, the Holy Spirit yearns with envy? That spirit's going to say, why? Are you allowing the evil in this world to draw you in, to suck you in because of your desires, because of the pleasure that it offers? And that's exactly what he's saying here, is that don't you know that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives within you, that he caused to dwell in us, yearns with envy? But he gives us more grace. This is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
He's speaking to those who make these compromises with the world. Why? So they can secretly satisfy their own personal pleasures and do so in the name of Christ. And this is not what we've been called to do because we may be in the world, but we are not of the world. In Ephesians, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord in his mighty power, not in our own power, not that we're going to sacrifice so that we can become powerful, but we sacrifice ourselves knowing that we are powerless without him. So be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. And a lot of times this is talked about, but yet people just roll through it like it's some little phrase. But what is the full armor of God? Paul gives us a perfect example so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. All right. So the devil, when does he scheme? Always ceaselessly. He will never stop scheming. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, it goes on to say for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this world's darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, which it will come, you will be able to stand your ground, and having done everything to stand. So stand firm then with the belt of truth. And we know the truth comes from Jesus and his spirit lives within us and the spirit of truth needs to be dominant in our lives. The spirit needs to be dominant in our lives. That is truth. So the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? It's doing the right thing through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's doing the will of God. Not what we think we wanna do to please God, but allowing God to have full control of our lives, which is pleasing to God. And that is righteousness. So have your breastplate of righteousness arrayed. And with your feet, they should be fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Not to fight and argue, not to judge, not to make people feel badly or less of themselves, but the gospel of peace that offers hope. We need to have that in our lives. In addition to all of this, Take up the shield of faith. Trust. Know that the Lord has got your back. Take that field of sh uh, shield of faith up, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. With faith, you can do all things. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. A lot of people think, well, the Bible is really the sword, but it said the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. The spirit is where the power comes from in the lives of those who are in Christ. So take up the sword of the spirit. I don't care if you have a Bible or not. A lot of people in the world won't even have one because it's not one available to them. Are we gonna say they're helpless? Oh, sorry, you don't have that in your array today because you don't happen to have a Bible in your hand. That's nonsense. We have the word of God living within us. So take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Don't just pray words. Don't just make little salutations or thank yous, but pray in the Spirit at all times with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the states. Pray for everyone, pray for each other. Prayer also, or pray also for me, he said, that whenever I open my mouth, this is pretty cool, words may be given to me so that I will boldly make known the mystery of the gospel. He doesn't say, so that I will remember the Bible verses that I, I memorized, because guess what? That's not the way he lived. He allowed the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the sword of the spirit, to go before him. So he said, please pray that when I open my mouth, that the words be given to me 
so that I will boldly make known the mystery of the gospel. Mystery to those who are maybe hearing it for the very first time. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it fearlessly as I should. So when you think about the fact that we are in the world, we have to know that we are not of the world. And that doesn't just simply mean, oh, okay, because I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. That means that we need to separate ourselves from being foolishly pulled in to a compromised life that accepts the sin in this world. But he says to set ourselves apart so that we can be the light in the darkness. We are the light because we're not of the world. We are the light in the world to those who are of the world, which are darkness. And we are the salt, which is the mystery of the gospel, which is the truth that comes forth by the power of the Holy Spirit when we're speaking with others. That's why he wrote in Romans 12, one and two, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. I am yours. Here I am, Lord. Use me however you want to. That's holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual service of worship. So if you want to worship today, that's all you have to do. If you want to worship today, that's all you have to do. You know, a lot of times people think they have to go and there needs to be a worship leader to lead them into worship. What happened to the Lord and the Holy Spirit? Can't the Holy Spirit lead us into worship? Well, we've lost that. Many people have lost that. And then he goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. Why? Because this world is darkness and is fading away. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you with the mysteries of heaven and spiritual truths then you will be able to test and approve what is the good and pleasing, perfect will of God. And those are the things that the Lord put on my heart this week.